good morning. And I say that with all of the everything that comes with, you know, a spring ahead morning, groggy salutations. Am I right? I mean, I know I am for this household. Usually the kids are up and moving at this time and I'm having to, shh, mom's recording a sermon at them and they are still out. <sighs> and I still feel like I'm reeling from last spring when we did this whole time change spring ahead thing. But then last spring left us a lot to reel from. I mean, it's officially been a year. March 15th was our last Sunday in person at Grace Community Church, and that feels like a really wild ride. How are we here at the one year point already, and how are we still worshiping online? I know that I naively thought it would only be a few weeks, but here we are. So I shared this poem by Lynn Ungar last year, and I'm going to read it again now. I'm curious how it hits you after a year in this. Pandemic. What if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath the most sacred of times? Cease from travel, cease from buying and selling, give up just for now, on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray, touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has come clear. Do not reach out your hands, reach out your heart, reach out your words, reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, as long as we all shall live. And that was written on March 11th, 2020. Whew. And personally, I feel like we've taken this advice pretty seriously at Grace. I mean, we've centered down to use language that Lynn actually took from a Howard Thurman poem. Um, which I may share in a coming week if, um, if I get a chance, because it is a very beautiful poem. But we've centered down in ways that we've never dreamed of. We have reached out with our hearts instead of our hands. And I know, I know that our deacons have been keeping the phone lines busy, checking in on everyone, a ministry for which I am just so utterly grateful. And we found ways to connect and create warmth in these digital spaces that we had never considered channels for holding the sacred in the past. And in true Lenten spirit, we have braved this whole wilderness together. Hmm, center down. And speaking of wilderness... Our readings this morning touch on so many fascinating visuals, don't you think? I mean, let's think about what we heard Sandy saying from her, let's just say, absolutely gorgeous um, porch there with all the snow behind. I am so loving all the pictures that you've all been sharing of North Fork this week. Um, but some of that, those visuals that we've had have been like poisonous serpents and the gates of death and love and light. And I'm really grateful that the lectionary puts the gospels in conversation with the Hebrew scriptures, especially on bleary mornings like this, where that like stolen hour of sleep might have, you know, made me fail to make me, or it might have failed to make me curious about what on earth it means 
in the Gospel of John when he talks about providing, like, when he talks about, like, Moses lifting the serpent in the wilderness. I mean, how many times have I read that and not really questioned it? And it's, I can't just blame it on being tired because it's the time change. But because the lectionary has put these two together, then we know that he means that there's this like beautiful context, right? Of God providing this healing relief in the wilderness and this life-saving and life-giving reprieve from deadly snake venom. But first, the Israelites were whiny. Now, they had been traveling out of Egypt, and the farther they got from Egypt, the more fondly they remembered it. Mm. Now, let's keep in mind that these were enslaved people. Uh, but even so, hardship can be a super powerful eraser of past evils. And so the longer they journeyed and the farther they went, the more they longed for the, believe it or not, the good old days when they were enslaved in Egypt. They weren't remembering the back-breaking work and the soul-crunching days of toil because they were remembering that they had steady food. And not like really great food either, but at least they knew what they could expect, I guess. And not knowing for sure where they were going or where they would settle, they, they did what seems to be pretty typical of human nature. They got really whiny. And they got irritable and they quarreled with each other and they got mad at God for giving up on them. And they accused Moses of being a terrible leader, but they weren't actually starving, were they? I mean, they complained about it, but, um, hello, we've all heard of manna and they like, they, they kind of complained the same way that my kids do when they say that they're starving and wasting away because we run out of Cheez-Its, but we've got a whole fridge full of carrots and apples. I mean, it's the same thing, right? God had been steadily, steadily sending them manna, so much manna, 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 manna. They were basically, basically just like really impatient. They were over it. They were lashing out. And you know, God sometimes usually really responds to the lament but not this time, which brings up a whole lot of weird feelings for me, to be honest. I really love the stories where God is all love, but these kind of stories where God is like suddenly super harsh and sending snakes out to bite people, it, it leaves me like feeling like, uh, and like, what's that all about? It's not such an easy one. Last week during our time for families, I talked about covenants and what it means to live in covenant. And it's a pretty huge give and take. And there's a lot of trust that has to be had by everyone involved. It's more than a simple like contractual obligation in that it lives and it shifts and it adapts with every bump that those in covenant encounter together. And that's the thing, they encounter it together. But this, I mean, this was a pretty big bump. They were really disrespectful. So God did what God did and people died. And God then, after all that, went into loving God mode once the people were like, oh no, we're really sorry. And, you know, we go into that part that I'm more comfortable with, which is like light and light, love and light, you know, stuff. And he told Moses what to do to keep people from dying from these painful, poisonous bites. Okay. You know, it was to make a bronze serpent and put it on a stick. And I haven't quite figured out the visual for that. I should have Googled how other people have figured out the visual for that. But I, um, I've got some weird, weird visuals. Like, do you, is it straight? Do you stick it on the stick? Is it like curved around? Anyway, I should have Googled that at least, but I didn't because I'm, I'm going with my weird visuals on it. Um, but anyway, when I, whenever I'm really struck with discomfort by a piece of scripture, I usually like to linger there for a little bit to figure out like where that discomfort stems from, because usually that has more to do with me than it does to do with the scripture. So that's why, even though I've promised to talk about the Psalms all Lent, I have strayed over to Numbers. So 
I ask myself, um, when I don't understand a text, what does this text have to offer? Now, the simple version of reading this one was to say, God will punish you if you're big, whiny, cry, baby, and you're not satisfied with your manna. Just made up a jingle for it. I don't know. But that's certainly something we can find evidence of in the text. Oh my gosh, we can find so much evidence of that in the text, right? But why was this part of the story so essential that it survived years and years and years and years and years of oral tradition and was written down and was translated and canonized and has been preserved for us to read? What function did this story serve in ancient times? My rabbit is just knocking over his uh, food dish. He is not happy with his manna this morning either. If you're wondering what that commotion is. How is it perceived? How is the story um, perceived when it was told? How is it still perceived when it's told? How has the story saved lives? And how has it held lives captive through manipulation of this text? Now, I don't have answers to these questions, but I do hear this striking and loud and clear tone coming from it for our times. And this could act as a cautionary tale to us. I mean, the Israelites weren't the only people who ever experienced a sense of rosy retrospection. Anyone who's ever uttered a, well, back in my day, grumbling about today's youth has fallen prey to this one. And anytime we've longed for a simpler time or wanted to go back to the way things were, or maybe just to go back to life pre-COVID, anyone who's done these things has experienced this. But the reality is things weren't nearly as good as our brains would fool us into thinking. The, the, their, our minds are just really capable of filtering out bad traumatic stuff because we only saw and because we only saw the past from like our own perspective like right in here then we we have this vision of the world and the way it is that's not as universal as we would like to think so when we're thinking about this and especially in a pre-covid light since we are here at our anniversary i think about how toxic our, we, our working environments were and still are and how harsh and unforgiving our capitalist structures are when they're not forced by a pandemic to change. And yet, when I think about life pre-March 2020, I'm not thinking about those things. I only think about going to live theater or hugging my best friend and talking over coffee for hours with my face open instead of like just seeing each other's eyeballs. I'm not thinking about the ways that the same pre-COVID system had me convinced that I was only worth as much as I was able to produce, which kept me even busier than I am now. And I certainly don't consider how, or certainly, you know, well, yeah, I certainly don't consider how much harder it was for anyone else who didn't have as many protections and privileges as I do. COVID has been hard, but it has also been this like forced slowdown that has caused many companies who in the past would never have allowed accommodations like working from home for those with health issues. Um, they wouldn't have considered that seriously. And they um, really only did because they were threatened with having to cease operations altogether if they didn't. And so we've gotten a better view of the cracks in our society in this time. But with rosy retrospection, it's harder to see and remember these things, especially once we get out of them. I mean, we just want things to be good again, right? And you'll notice which tagline I've been avoiding saying, right? Like that's a whole other people grumbling about starving while having a ton of mana sermon. And I don't have the capacity for it on this time change Sunday. But I'll let you fill in the gaps this morning yourself. <clears throat> Perhaps you've had more coffee than me. It is important for us as we encounter difficult texts to look at them from all kinds of angles and to grapple with the reasons that they are hard for us. This morning, I'm wrestling with the times I've been the one complaining in the wilderness and wishing for the good old days or the simpler times. I'm asking God to forgive me for not seeing the bigger picture 
but instead wanting what I want in a super petulant tone. I'm grateful for all the times God didn't send snakes my way, no matter how whiny I've been. And I give praise for all the snake pits in my self-inflicted wildernesses that I've encountered when God already had that bronze snake on a stick ready for me to be healed. So, <clears throat> all of that said, we're going to circle this back home. This line about Moses holding up the serpent in the wilderness is the lesser known part of one of the most widely quoted bits of scripture out there. With this baffling serpent throwback story, we hear the lines, you know, like with this bit, it like leads into the lines, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son to condemn the world, but in order that the world may be saved through him. And when we read all these things together, we see that God is motivated by love for a repentant people and sending the serpent that heals in the numbers story. And the writer of John uses this as like this historical reference, this touch point, and a way of rooting what will be said next. <clears throat> a way for those who are reading or hearing this to already know what to expect. God is again acting out of this huge love but in order to save the whole world this time from the venomous, painful, deadly, evil snake bar this snake bites, snake bites this time. It is a wider covenantal love, one that is constantly adjusting as the darkness grows or fades, and is tweaking the ways in which we can love each other and which and the ways in which that love can be lived out. And while this love is spread over us like a warm blanket on a chilly day, it is important that we uphold our part of that covenant by loving God, loving ourselves, and loving our neighbors in forward-thinking ways that rely less on rosy retrospection and more on creating a world filled with light and truth. Some of that other imagery from today's reading. And so before we go, I'd like to share with you this short meditation that I found on worship ways. So please get into a comfortable position. Settle into your seats and close your eyes. And visualize a place of emptiness, of shadows. What comes up for you? If this first image is too disturbing, find another place of imagination that offers you comfort and peace. Imagine your presence there. Now imagine that with you is the presence of Jesus as a glimmer of light. What does that light look like? Stay there a moment with Jesus, the light. As you focus your attention on the glimmer of light, hear this. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten child. For God so loved the world that God gave. For God so loved the world. For God so loved, so loved. 
the world. God. And as you open your eyes, remember, God so loves the world. May God, your maker, send you back into the world with creative energies refreshed even after a time change. May Christ the light illuminate your fearful moments. And may the Holy Spirit of steadfast love guide you until we worship together again, this day and forevermore. Amen.